the trees regarding our gender identity and sexuality. When there's no place like home, empty air and empty stairs. Civil rights out on the cruel streets tonight. Paul Quinn is not only a wonderful human being, Paul is also gorgeous, as you can see from my background, and Paul is also an extremely talented singer songwriter. Paul is credited as one of the pioneers of Irish electronic music, and Paul has a new album due to be released very shortly called Life on Earth. Paul is showcasing the album at an extravaganza event in the Pepper Canister Church in Dublin on the 11th of June. Paul is also my guest today and we'll tell you all about that and invite you to come along and see the show on the 11th of June. We're joined today on LGBTQ Plus Life with the um, performer composer um paul quinn so paul welcome to uh, dublin city fm and welcome to the program hi thank you for having me thanks so much for having me it's a it's a pleasure paul paul uh, um you're a very uh how can i put it you've got a very striking image you've also got quite a striking sound so i'm going to ask you uh, at the beginning which came first, did the image or uh, the uh, interest in music come first? Um, I definitely, definitely singing was the, was the opener. Singing began when I was four or five years old. Mm -hmm. I had a grandmother who loved hearing me sing, and this was the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So it was Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, and all those kind of sh tunes that were big on the radio at the time. So grandmother had me singing, standing up in her kitchen, singing constantly, and would say, oh, that, that boy's got a lovely voice. That child can sing, you know, <laughs> and so, that, that, that came along very, very early. That gave me a great boost as a kid because I knew I could do something and do it quite well. So, um, so singing, singing has been with me for as, from, from as long as I can remember, from the age of reason, mm -hmm. always there in the background. Yeah. Am I right in thinking, Paul, some of your formative years were not in Ireland, that you, were, uh, you grew up, uh, yes. generally say it, in our uh, uh, other island across the way? <laughs> well, I was born in London in Hammersmith Hospital, yeah. Um, but yeah, but um, we, we returned to Ireland when I was only two years old. Okay. So I've no real memories. I've no real memories of that time in London. And um, so, an Irish parents, so I'm very much, I'm very much a paddy yeah. to the to the dark roots of my hair, you know. Yeah. No. No. I, the reason why I ask that is, is because whenever uh, people of my generation uh, we got any pretensions about doing anything arty or yes, 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 yes. Uh, pull yourself together. You know, that's for other people, uh, particularly <laughs> on the south side of Dublin. So, did you have a supportive and an encouraging uh, uh, family in that regard, Paul? Yeah, I mean, th this was kind of a, a much simpler time um, for, for people. You know, we didn't have internet and we didn't have all of that. So the family sat around watching a lot of TV. Both my parents loved music. Mm -hmm. And my mum had brothers who were involved in show bands and things like that. One of my dad's uh, brothers was a professional musician as well. So there was music on both sides of the family and it was very much encouraged. So my parents themselves, my dad had a beautiful singing voice. My mum liked to sing as well, but they didn't really do anything with it. But they would have been pretty encouraging. At the same time, though, the message was get yourself a proper job. You know, they, they would have been they would have been concerned. My dad was an electrician, so he wanted me to go into the trade. But um, it became evident that I wasn't going to be an electrician. I was going to be a star rather than a sparks. You know, yeah, you, might been, you might have been a live wire, but not an electrician. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not an electrician. No, no. Not that there's anything wrong with electricians of course great work if you can get it but uh yeah no i made it i made it obvious i wanted to follow a career in in some area of sh the show business world and they were pretty okay with that you know they were okay with that that's good that's very interesting because uh i'm a bit older than you but i do remember the 60s and the 70s very well and what i remember by and large is 
It was RTE. That's what you got. That's mm. where that's where your sounds and your visuals yeah. came from. Yeah, Particularly yeah. Uh, if you were looking for music. I mean, okay, some of us used to go off there and listen to pirate radio, and we'd listen to yeah, radio Caroline. and things like that. exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But what did, what were the influences that came to you out of that, Paul? Because uh, yes, while well, the the show band environment or the the show band industry was a very robust and it was a very uh, well supported most of it was derivative if you know what i'm saying it, what, it, right. you, you weren't yeah. it was cover versions that's perfectly it, it was covers yeah, yeah. it was it was yeah it was entertainment rather than songwriting and i was I, from a very very young age i was in, i was interested in the craft of songwriting mm -hmm. and when i was 15 with a schoolmate who'd done eight or nine grades on the piano and he was a very competent musician so we got together and we started actually writing melodies and writing words mm -hmm. and, and we won a talent show local talent show we won a trophy three of us mm -hmm. and uh, i was i at that point in my life i became aware that i could write songs myself just mm -hmm. like the songs that we were that we heard on the radio or that we saw on top of the pops mm -hmm. so I, I never had any intention of being like an entertainer as in like a cover version singer. I wanted to be a writer and it was very important for me to be able to put my struggles, I would say my teenage struggles into words. And that's really what I focused on. And that's kind of still what I'm focusing on all of these years later, you know, so. Yeah. But influence wise, the first band that came along that really grabbed me heart and soul were ABBA. I was a huge ABBA fan in the 1970s. And to this day, the voices of Anita and Frida and the harmonies, and they're all over my music as well, because I was so deeply touched and influenced by that sound, which nobody has recaptured ever since, you know. Well, it's interesting you should say that because people don't tend to appreciate just just how uh, complex some of their songs were oh. we, all, we all know how to sing along to dancing queen and knowing me yeah. and knowing you but, but yeah. the musical arrangements were incredibly complex in Incredible and, and very, very difficult to sing. I would dare anyone to try to take on Knowing Me, Knowing You with its two octave range, you know, or or the winner takes it all. Very few people would can can handle an ABBA tune. They're very, very complex. You're right. Extremely complex. Yeah. yeah. Well, even watching uh, Eurovision now uh, recently, uh, there's something about whatever it is about Swedish culture, they have grasped mm. the nuance mm. of a pop song, mm. have they not? They really do. You're right. I was watching the Swedish entry last night and I could see a lot of Agnetha Felskog in the girl that was performing. That melancholy, that icy kind of glacial beauty and all of that is there. Um, it's in their DNA, isn't it? It's not something that's manufactured. It's part of who they are, you know, so. Well, again, it's interesting you should say that, Paul, because it seems to me that they have a very good uh, system of musical education. So if somebody mm -hmm. like yourself was uh, to grow, mm -hmm. uh, had been growing up in Sweden, I think mm -hmm. you would probably have got an incredibly good grounding. Plus, they all speak English uh, yes. extremely well. Mm -hmm. They learn it from the age of eight. I've spent a bit of time in Stockholm. I've, uh, Stockholm's one of my favourite cities in Europe, mm -hmm. and the dream is to go and record there one day. All the great, all the best pr uh, producers actually work out of Sweden, so I would love maybe for my next album to get the chance to do some work over there. You know, if if it, if it comes to pass. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting uh, when they had Maniskin on the uh, Eurovision uh, as the halftime entertainment. One of the mm. things they paid tribute to was the fact that they had been working with Max Martin. Uh, oh, right, yes, yes, we all yes. Know from the Britney Spears fame. Mm, mm. So now I left Ireland in '73, Paul. So that can give you an idea mm. of uh, you know my my vintage is the way I will put it. You've given the game away. You're you're giving the whole game away there. Oh, Jesus I know. <laughs> and it's interesting because um, when I saw the movie The Commitments, and I saw it yeah. when I was living in Australia. That really got to me because that was my childhood. That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, uh, Roddy Dawn slightly got us uh, took a liberty because he said we listened to soul. We actually listen mm. to blues music, and that's how uh, uh, we yes. got much out of it. But so where are we? Where were the places that you would have gone, Paul, or were you a a, a, a shy retiring violet, which I would find very difficult to believe? Well, if you saw the commitments, you saw me because I'm in that film. Are you? 
Yes, yes. So I, ha- I had a, a walk on part in that movie. I got a door slammed in my face oh. and I got, to, I got to say a line or two. And I mean, a couple of scenes. Um, so as were most budding musicians in Ireland at that time. But uh, that clip used to get shown a lot and it really used to embarrass me at the time, me getting, <laughs> getting the door slammed in my face and not for the first time or the last time either. But um, yeah. I uh, that that was my era too. I mean, I started doing gigs in Dublin in, in clubs like Sides Nightclub on Dame Street, yeah. which was a mixed gay straight club, yeah. um, and I started doing gigs in there in the 1987, 1988 okay. kind of period. So it was even ahead of that. And then we moved away from doing gigs and focused mostly on recording work. And my first vinyl single came out in 1990, 1989, 1990. That was A Better Place and The Colour of Rain. And that got onto mainstream radio. Um, it was a huge radio hit here in Ireland at that time. So um, that was really a load of doors opened at that time. But one for one reason or another, we, the band that I was in, we didn't get our record deal. We didn't get to that stage of Top of the Pops and all of that. And for a few years, I thought it was all over. I thought, well, I've had my bite of the cherry and it didn't it didn't really work out. And I drifted off into doing off, an office job for years. And then I came back to this and I said, to hell with this. I don't, it doesn't really matter to me what age I am or what stage I'm at in my life. I'm going to make an album. And things have just taken off like a rocket. Um, I'm, I'm getting loads of radio play, getting loads of media coverage, just doing really, really well with these songs. And they're only the beginning because now I've started working with the UK producer called Mark Saunders, who produced Cindy Loper and The Cure mm-hmm. and various other people, Dexy's Midnight Runners, Erasure, Human League. Him and I are writing songs together now, and this is bringing it all up to a whole new level because he knows how to craft a really great uh, pop song. So things are just snowballing and developing, and um, I can't keep up with it myself. It's really weird to have this happening at this particular point in my life, you know. Can I put something to you then, Paul, is that one of the pe- one of the uh, aspects that people always complain to me about uh, the Irish entertainment industry for what our mm. entertainment environment that it's it's very much um, about who gets ordained who gets ordained I mean uh, mm-hmm. at the time uh, I've seen lots of good musicians and lots of bands come and go and then you yes. see others get promoted um, to a certain mm. degree is it mm. what's your experience in that regard is it is it that uh, cre- creatively um, um, restrictive is the way I would put it. Well, we landed Louis Walsh as a manager. My band, Bizarre, we, we landed Louis Walsh as our manager in 1989. This was when he was still a show band man before he'd gone on to kind of put together bands like Poison. So we were his first kind of experiment. He'd been managing Johnny Logan and Linda Martin. Mm-hmm. And then he picked up on us. He wanted to create a, or he wanted to, maybe ride the coattails of a, of a, a duo, a synth pop duo. Mm-hmm. And, but at the time, I, I'd have to go back to the LGBTI thing because at the time there was still a lot of homophobia in Ireland and, and, and gay guys making music weren't taken very seriously. So mm-hmm. when, when, you, when we came along with this really wild androgynous look, people did not want to know. They said, okay, mm-hmm. we already had the Virgin Prunes and we've had a uh, culture club and we've had Dead or Alive. These guys are going nowhere because, because we were gay boys who were very, very mm-hmm. outrageous and very androgynous. And um, that was a big part in what happened to us and the fact that we didn't get signed to a major label in the UK. It, it, was, it was down to the fact of how we looked and who we were people at that time we were entering into the 90s and Britpop was about to take over a lot of 80s artists were losing their record deals being dropped by their labels and so it was the wrong time it was completely the wrong time and what I've come to realize now in the wisdom of of my older more mature years I will say is that it's all about timing you have to be in the right place at the right time and that sounds like a corny old cliche but you'll know this yourself it's so so true to what you know where you are at that time is is really what matters you know yeah no very much so I mean uh, you could you can see that that uh, there were a lot of bands in the you know in the mid 80s and suddenly along came grunge and uh, yeah, they were yeah. no longer relevant and as you say the same thing that happened with uh with Britpop along came uh Oasis, yeah. along came Blur. yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me and this is something i'm uh, i'm fascinated as well mm. about all, the look um what mm-hmm. were your influence i mean uh I, I, am i right in thinking there might be a bit of pete burns there at somewhere down mm. the track was pete somebody that uh, you uh, shall we say took it took ideas from 
Yeah, well, I, I met Pete in London a couple of times, a lovely man. He, he, oh, he made a very lasting impression on me. Um, a very, very, very underrated artist and musician and brilliant, all around brilliant person. But um, no, I was in the first kind of people that I was looking at were people like Gavin Friday here in Ireland with the Virgin Proof and Bitty. Yeah, and I saw those guys on TV and I thought, well, I want to look like that. Even though I was a young, pudgy gay boy and yeah. um, listening to ABBA, I was still looking at the likes of uh, uh, Gavin and the prunes and saying, wow, you know, when I grow up, that's what I want to be. And then I saw David Bowie and the New York Dolls. So, and it was the punk era too. Like I would have been eight years old at the height of punk. So as a child, you're taking all of those influences in. So gothic glamour, punk, old Hollywood, it's all in there really in me. Mm -hmm. And it finds expression through wearing the stuff that I wear, uh, mostly for photo shoots these days. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't go out that much. I'm not kind of living the nightclubbing life that I once did. Mm -hmm. But um, but certainly when it comes to performing on stage or doing music videos, I like to go all out. And it's pure, just pure androgyny, is, I think is all you could really call it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there was, again, going back to 2022 uh, Eurovision, there was a band from San Marino, and we ask ourselves, where's San Marino? <laughs> 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 that really did that for me. They, were, they had that androgynous uh, punk, it was like, um punk meets sweet and i just love them mm. uh, they, mm. i don't know why they didn't get through because uh, i thought yeah oh, they were fabulous all together um so coming back to uh, the musical uh, influences you're you're described on your uh, website paul as a pioneer of electro irish electronic music now um because I didn't live here at the time, I can't say I'm that familiar with Irish electronic music. But when I do, I think of the early 80s, when I think of, uh, if, if you like, what came through the mm. uh, the new romantics. And I particularly mm. think of the Germans, Ralph uh, mm. for mm. Tangerine Dream. What, what was your, um, shall we say, influences in that regard? Well, we had an, an Irish band called Auto de Fay, which were Trevor Knight and Gay Woods, and they were the first kind of electronic pop art. They were folk musicians who um, discovered a keyboard, and I think they got a Fairlight synthesizer, and they started making these glorious little kind of pop songs, dark, very dark pop songs. Mm -hmm. And I used to go and see their gigs in Bray, because I grew up in the town of Bray, and they used to play there quite a lot in the Dug Inn, which uh, a place called the Dug Inn, <laughs> which was also known, which was known as the Drug Inn as well. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But I used to go along and sneak in and see them. And um, so they were an early influence on me, but it was myself and another guy, Aidan, Casserly. At the end of the 1980s in Ireland, we were the only two artists that were really making electronic music. Mm -hmm. And Aidan is now the producer of this album. He's produced almost all the tracks on this album. So we're friends for over 30 years. He's got his own separate career to me. He's released about 40 albums, I think, at this point. Mm -hmm. And so Aidan and myself were the only ones really doing that that type of music in Ireland during the late 1980s. So I guess in a way we are pioneers. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you, uh, most of the people who I know uh, who are musicians, and particularly the singer-songwriters, mm. the ones who are p performers uh, suffered badly during COVID and during the pandemic. But the ones yes. who are writers, the ones who are the creative souls, I think a lot of them prospered. Uh, in the mm. sense, mm. Gave mm. people a time to say, you can't go out and play, but you can if, you, uh, uh, if you're focused, you can tap into your creative side how did yeah. uh, how did you experience the pandemic paul well it's a very good point you make you're, you're 100 percent um, accurate about that mick it's kind of i found that i could email people and i could send people texts people in the business who in the past might have been just too busy to talk to me and suddenly they had the time and they were willing maybe to do you a favor or maybe uh, send you off to some other contact or whatever so people became much more contactable and much more willing and much more um you know having the time to actually listen to to what you had to say and i got a lot of work done during that time including making videos on the sly when we weren't supposed to be not that i was breaking restrictions or anything but we did a few things naughtily when we shouldn't have been doing them together get them done uh, as I think a lot of creative people did but you're right um, performing isn't my main thing my main thing is songwriting mm -hmm. and being in the studio and, and uh, spending days la layering harmonies and, and all of that kind of stuff so 
performing is kind of set the secondary part of what I do. I'm mostly a recording artist, I would say. And um, so, yeah, um, COVID, the COVID, the fact that we were all locked down gave me a huge focus. And I, I do think this album might never have been made had it not been for what came along at that time. Bizarre as that might be to say, you know. So again, to put something to you, Paul, people are saying to me, those who I know in the uh, industry, they're saying, there's no money to be made in recorded music anymore because of mm. downloads, because of mm. because Spotify, a whole range of, uh, shall we say, constraints. Uh, yes. If you, if you want to be a professional musician these days, you, you, you have to perform. What's your thoughts on that? Is, or, is that secondary to your consideration? Is making money secondary to your consideration? Um, I've never, making money was never, ever, ever important to me. I grew up in a working class family. We never had money. We had no real respect for money. When we got money, we spent it. And, um, you know, there was no frugality or anything like that. And I've always been extremely um, foolish with money myself. I just get it and I spend it when I have it. So it, it's kind of, money was never a driving force for me. I never had any ambitions about making money. But now I find myself at this point in my life where making money is going to become very important. You know, we all have our older years, shall we say, ahead of us. You need to have money to to have any kind of quality of life after retirement. So, you know, it's all of those things that you start to think about. So now I'm very, very eager um, to be rewarded financially for what I do. I think that's very, very important. It's only now that artists are, are, are standing up and saying, look, we deserve to be paid. You know, we just because we don't put on a suit and tie or a shirt and tie and go into an office every day or into a bank, we work our asses off and we give ourselves nervous breakdowns and ulcers with the, with the whole creative process and perfectionism and we should be paid for it. So I'm very, very aware now that I should be paid. And I know what you say is true. Um, unless you get out and do gigs, you can't really make any money and you can't develop a following so that's where i am now um i'm doing this gig in the pepper canister there's another one going to follow that i think in the wild duck and um, i'm going to keep on just working and working with the live thing and um, to create my following and to, to cultivate my audience that's yeah. very very important to me now but also to make some money and to make make a bit of a living as well out of it you know? absolutely just listening to you there uh, paul it struck me that when we're young we tend to listen to the identity songs in ABBA, you know knowing me knowing you definitely yeah. yeah. maybe you should have listened to money 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 it's a rich <laughs> Well, you're not you're not the first one that has said that to me. My mum used to say that to me as well. So yeah. when are you going to make some money? You know, so. <laughs> yeah. Paul, you've uh, you've alluded to uh, one of our prime uh, motivations for speaking to you today, and that is you are doing a launch of the album. It is going to be live. And it, uh, mm -hmm. so tell the listeners about it, uh, where it's going to happen and how they can come and see Paul Quinn. Yeah, well, a friend of mine had suggested to me, he said, if you're going to do this launch, um, Derek Byrne, a very good friend of mine, yeah. um, who was running, for, who ran for the Shannon last time, mm -hmm. and will probably do so again. He's well. he a lovely man. Yes, he's a lovely man, but he's a good friend of mine. He said, look, you don't want to just do, you know, turn up and play a pub or go to the, you know, some club or whatever. Do it large and do it, do it grand. So we were looking at Christchurch Cathedral and then that didn't work out. That was just a little bit too ambitious for me. So picked on the pepper canister I walked into the place had a look at it loved it and I said this is where I want to have my performance as it turns out I couldn't even get the dates I wanted because it's so heavily booked with bands coming in and doing gigs there but the sound and everything is amazing the ambience I'm told it's haunted there's a resident ghost which I'm fascinated by um, and so yeah so it's happening on the 11th of June at um in the pepper Canada. so it's a saturday the 11th of june at 8 p.m um an electro pop band called frozen stairs from waterford um are opening for me i'm going to have flo max sweeney on stage with me who was a very famous irish singer and toy with rhythm moving hearts she had a great career in television presenting and we're going to do a billy holiday song a jazz song in tight harmony together um i've got keely who uh, you may have heard of as well. She's uh, just been signed to Dimple Discs in the UK. She's going to do a Smith song with me. And we may, I'm hoping to have Martin McCann from SAC, who are another legendary Irish queer band as well. Well, Martin is, <laughs> they're not a queer band, I shouldn't say that. Martin is a very famous Irish um, gay man and the band aren't, uh, but he, 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 you know, his his contribution to that band is, is obviously huge. So I'm hoping Martin will come on stage with me and doing everything but the girls song that we both love as well. So it'll be that. 
me telling the stories behind the songs and performing all of the album as well as a couple of new songs so it's a lot to take on it's a very very big gig um it's 14 15 songs that i'll be performing live on the night it's a long time since i performed live so you could say i'm extremely nervous and if you're there on the night i've no doubt that you will hear how nervous i am for the first two songs <laughs> we have every confidence in you paul um is the album not going to be available on then or are people going to be able to get uh, shall we say yeah. pre-release versions of the album well the album won't be available digitally for a couple of months unfortunately because my label that released me are in are in russia and you know there's a huge amount going on then, there at the moment yeah, so it's cargo, really isn't there mm -hmm. yes so my label manager said i don't want this album to to disappear through the cracks i want to hang on and, and mm -hmm. put it out uh, at the beginning of september shall we say however on the night in the pepper canister in keeping with it being an album launch there will be um uh digipack albums available the album will be available for purchase on the night so those that come to the gig will get their hands onto the album and i know the tracks i think you're going to play a track from the album as well mm -hmm. so people will be hearing stuff on radio but on on the night you can actually get uh you'll be able to get a a cd or a physical copy of the album if you want so i'm hoping that people will do that and they'll hear the full album then at home as well as well as on the night you know yeah. well we're, go uh, we're unfortunately going to run out of time today but we're going to play out with one of your songs i believe it's called mm -hmm. sympathy um can you yeah. just tell the listeners what was the what's the uh, the basis of this song what's uh, what's what, what is it about well this to me is a very very important topic i'm constantly ranting about it on twitter there's a very political side to me so very briefly it's about homelessness it's about the growing epidemic of homelessness and the normalization of homelessness and um which i think is a huge concern but what's interesting about this song is that it was written in 1969 by a band called rare bird and i've brought the song i've updated it i've added another verse and another chorus new lyrics melodies but originally it was their tune and it, they were talking about homelessness on the streets of london in the 1960s and here we are in Dublin, you know, 50, 50 odd years later, and we have the same epidemic um, going on, and, and which seems to be getting worse with every month, the figures. So it's a song about not having a roof over your head. And what does that mean? And how terrifying is that going to be? Um, and it reflects upon the idea that a little bit of sympathy goes a long way, you know, for, for people in distress. <laughs> Paul Quinn, it has been a delight talking to you. We look forward to catching up with you. 11th of June, Pepper Canister Church. We're going to play out with sympathy. Thank you so much, Mick. Thank you for having me. tonight before you lock and bolt the door think of those out in the cold and dark think of those without a home half the world hates the other half and all the money's with the few and half the world lies down and quietly starts When there's not enough love to go round And sympathy is all you need, my friend Sympathy is all you need And sympathy is all you need, my friend When there's not enough love to go round before you plump up your pillows right Before you turn to go to sleep Think of those out in the freezing cold Out there where the night is deep Now half the world hits the other half And half the world's got all the food and half the world lies down and quietly starves Cause there's not enough love to go round And sympathy is all you need, my friend And sympathy is all you need And sympathy is all you need 
need my friend when there's not enough love to go round and sympathy is all you need my friend sympathy is what we need and sympathy is all you need my friend when there's not enough love to go round Before you climb into your bed tonight Like home.